So keep something in Matthew 5. We will come back later uh, towards the end of the sermon. But if you would, go over to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. I want to talk to you, uh, or preach to you this morning, rather, about the subject of being kind. The subject of being kind. You know, and this is an important subject because of the fact that, you know, sometimes we as God's people get this rap, especially if you're in a church like this where there's a lot of hard preaching, where the entire council of the Word of God is preached. But sometimes people think, oh, you're just mean-spirited, angry people. And sometimes, you know, we can, uh, you know, we can lend some validity to, that, to that, uh, that accusation. Now, of course, there's times to be stern. There's times to be blunt. There's times to be very straightforward and to not hold anything back. But I think another thing that sometimes gets left off uh, is the fact that we are to be very kind people. You know, uh, if you look there in Proverbs chapter 31, and this is, of course, you know, talking about the virtuous woman. It says there in verse 26, one of the great attributes that the virtuous woman has is that she opened her mouth with wisdom and her in her tongue is the law of kindness. And that's where I get the title for the sermon this morning, the law of kindness. It said it's found there in her tongue. When she opens her mouth with wisdom, it's there in her tongue, this law of kindness. Now, you would say, well, you know, this is talking about the virtuous woman, so this only applies to her, right? But we'll see in Scripture this morning that, you know, being unkind, you know, is becoming of any Christian. This isn't just a feminine attribute. This isn't just something that's reserved only for the virtuous woman. This is a virtue that we all, as God's people, should desire to have in our, in our lives. And it should be said of all of us that in our tongue is found the law of kindness. <laughs> it's not just for this, you know, the virtuous woman. It's not just a feminine attribute. Now, of course, you know, guys, they need to be tough. They need to be, you know, rough. They need to be able to be a little bit more blunt at times. But even as men, you know, we should be, ha uh, the, the law of kindness should be found in our mouth as well. Amen. Go over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and when you get there, go ahead and bookmark Ephesians 1. We're going to come back again. You know, being kind isn't just for the virtuous woman. It's for all of God's people. And I can say that assuredly because of the fact that kindness is an attribute of the Lord. And we all know that God is a man. And that God, you know, he's called the Heavenly Father. And he is, a very, he is very kind. The Bible says in Psalms 117, it says, Oh, praise the Lord, all, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people. For his merciful kindness is great toward us. You know, God is a very kind God. God is a very merciful God. And we, as God's people, should be kind and merciful people. We should have the law of kindness found in our mouths. Go over to Ephesians chapter 1. You know, it's interesting there in Psalm 117, it says, Praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people. And then what's the reason behind that? Why should they praise him? Why should all nations and all people praise God? For his merciful kindness is great toward us. Look there in Pro or excuse me, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in, G in Christ Jesus, then the ages to come he might show the, uh, the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. The Bible saying here that God has made us to sit in heavenly places and that in the ages to come, he's going to use us sitting in those heavenly places to show the exceeding riches of his grace. Yep. People are going to look at us throughout all ages and they're going to say they are an example of God's exceeding riches of the exceeding riches of God's grace. Right. And how is it that we're going to show that? In, in, in his kindness toward us. It's the fact that Christ saved us. The fact, the great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins, that God was very kind toward us and saved us through Christ Jesus. And that that is going to, what we are going to be an example of throughout all ages. That we are going to be the examples of God's exceeding riches of his grace. His kindness toward us. So we see right out of the gate here that the law of kindness is something we should all have. And it's not just for ladies because of the fact that God is very kind. And that throughout all ages, we are going to be an example to everybody of God's kindness towards us. Not only should we be kind, not only should the law of kindness be found on our tongues because of the fact that God is kind, but because of the simple fact that being kind is a commandment. You know, it's the law of kindness. It's a commandment to be kind. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And this is all throughout the New Testament and the Bible. 
when we could spend the whole morning just talking about God's kindness toward us. But God has also commanded us to be kind. <clears throat> First Peter chapter 3, look at verse 8. It says, Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evi evil, railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are hereunto call thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Now, maybe the word kind isn't there, but we, actually, we do see for sure there in, in verse 8, you know, the attributes of being kind, action, you know, kind actions are laid out there. Having compassion one of another. That's a kind thing to do, to have compassion on somebody. To love as brethren. You know, loving, you know, be, uh, God's loving kindness. We are to love one another. To be pitiful. You know, to have mercy on people. To be courteous. You know, that's something that's really missing in society today. Just common courtesy. Yeah. You know, and that's one thing that, that even if the world could get grasp a hold of would be great. You know, not that it's gone completely. Some people still get it. You know, they'll go ahead and hold the door open, say hello, look in the eye. Now, I know this time of year in, in, in Southwest, it gets really hard to be kind to everybody because it's, you know, 100 and whatever degrees and everyone's just kind of on edge, you know, and everyone's getting a little irritable. But, you know, even when things aren't going well, we should still strive to be kind with, with one another. And not just brethren. You know, we should try to be kind to everybody that we come in contact with out in the world. Go over to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. The Bible says in Colossians 3, go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Maybe that's part of the reason why people fail to be kind sometimes, because it takes humility. Sometimes it takes humility to turn that blinker on and just be like, all right, you can go faster than me. I'm going to pull over. Let me be courteous here. Let me go, let you go by, right? Let me hold the door open. Let me look you in the eye and say good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is. Let me say thank you, please, being courteous. These all require humbleness of mind. But we're supposed to put these things on as the elect of God. You know, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy. These things should be deep-rooted in us. Uh, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. And if any man have quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye, and above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which you are called also in one body, and be ye thankful. You're going over to Second Peter. I'll continue to read to you from Titus chapter 3. It says, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. You know, this is a commandment for us to be kind in the New Testament towards all men. For we ourselves were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy. These are the things that are opposite of kindness. To be malicious, to be envious, uh, hateful, and hating one another. But after the kindness and love of God, our Savior uh, uh, toward, uh, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. You know, even when we were living in malice, when we were envious, when we were hateful, and hating one another, when we were all these bad things, you know, the kindness and, uh, of God still appeared towards us. And the love of God through our Savior appeared towards all men. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 4, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Now that's a very familiar verse, and you'll hear that brought up a lot. And people, you know, I, I kind of think, I, I, I feel like it's misapplied a little bit. I think when people read that, they read it like this. They may know what you ought to answer every man. And sometimes we get caught up, and, you know, they apply this a lot to soul winning and saying, you know, when you, you got to go out soul winning, you got to be able to make sure you know how to answer the Mormon and the Jehovah Witness and, and this false, you know, cult and this cult and whatever. You got to know how to talk to every person, you know, based on whatever their background is saying, you know, what you ought to answer every man, okay? But really, the truth is, there's one gospel for everybody, and that's another subject. But it says here that you may know how you ought to answer every man. More importantly than what you're actually going to answer is, a lot of times, how you go about answering them. 
You know, a lot of times people go out soul winning and they knock on doors and they can't get anybody to talk to them. And it's not really what they're saying, it's how they're saying it. That's the problem. And he's saying, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. If there's one place you want to have the law of kindness in your mouth, it's when you're trying to preach the gospel to somebody. And that's not the time to, you know, knock on their door and start pointing out, you know, everything that's wrong with their life. And, you know, hey, I couldn't help but notice on my way up to your door that you've got, you know, an idolatrous statue of Mary in the front yard. And boy, have they got some down here, right? They've got some, some whoppers. I've seen some, you know, good ones as far as, you know, uh, idolatrous statues go. They got pyramids in the front yard. Remember that? Yeah, it's crazy. Never seen anything like that. But you're going to walk up that door and be like, you know, you, you know hey, I'm from uh, Faith Word Baptist Church, and you, know, you should really burn that down. <laughs> you know, I, I, just, I couldn't help it. I kind of kicked it over in my way up here and, and smashed it a thousand pieces. And here's why. You know, that's not letting your speech be all way with grace. You know? and, I, and again, I know there's a time when we ought to, you know, uh, you, know, you know, after the first and second admonition, you know, reject the heretic. That some people need to be rebuked sharply. But I think it's few and far between. You know, most of the time, the vast majority of the time when we're out there talking to people, trying to preach, the, you know, the, the love and the kindness and the mercy and the grace of God, that's the time to let your speech be seasoned with grace. And be careful how you, ought, you, how, how you answer every man. Now, I had you go to Second Peter uh, chapter 1, look at verse 5. It says, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. So again, having the law of kindness in your mouth, being a kind person, is a commandment. It's a law. It's something that God tells us to do, to add brotherly kindness to our faith. The Bible says in John chapter 13, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. You know, if you wear a badge, you know, if you wear a hat that says faithful word, you know, or, or whatever. Is that how everyone's going to know? What, what, you know, we've got an armband or something? Something that they can visually look at us and identify us as, you know, brethren? No, he said, if you, love, if you have love one toward another. You know, the world should look at us as Christians and should say, look at the way these people are, are so kind to one another. Look how they care about each other. Look how meek and long-suffering and patient. Look at the, the, the brotherly love that they have towards one another. And they say, why can't, you know, that's different than what's out in the world. They're very courteous. They're pitiful. They're merciful. These should be the things that, you know, uh, that we shine. Let our, these are the good works that we should shine. That, that all men may glorify our, our Father which is in heaven. These are the things that, that people should look at in our life and say, there's something about these Christians. There's something different. But if they look in and all they see is just a bunch of bickering and backbiting and anger and malice and enviousness, you know, they're going to say, well, what's, what's different? I've got plenty of that out in the world. You know, I, you know I, I, I go to church and everyone's just... You know, no one shakes my hand, no one says hello, some visitor walks in. Now, thank God that isn't a, the problem here. You know, I, everybody here is great about that. Visitor walks in, you know, they're getting handshakes, they're getting greeted. I think it's great. And that's the way it ought to be. But let's keep it that way. I mean, people, if they're looking to get treated poorly, they can just, you know, go out in the world just about anywhere. <clears throat> that shouldn't be said of God's people, though. They should look at us and see the love that we have one to, no, one to another and say, these must be Jesus' disciples. So people are to be kind. You know, they're to be kind uh, because it's a commandment. It's a law that God has given us, the law of kindness. Now, I know this isn't, you know, the show-stopping sermon, okay? I know this isn't going to be the viral, you know, a, you know, million hits on YouTube or whatever sermon. And it's unfortunate because really it's, you know, that YouTube, the online crowd could really stand a good dose of this, Amen. you know, because there's a lot of unkindness on social media. Because it's so easy to be unkind on social media when you're anonymous, when no, you, know, you don't have to look anybody in the face and actually say the things you're about to say. When no one even knows who you are, you can just kind of let it all hang out. You can just say whatever. You can be as kind, unkind and rude and crass as you want, and there's no, really no repercussions. I mean, other than the fact that God sees, other than the fact that God knows what's being said. And people, you know, they need, but we all need this. We all need to be reminded to be kind, you know, because our nature is to be unkind. We are, you know, by nature, you know, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. 
you know, the spirit, the ma spirit of man is with him is, is a, you know, is, is a, a covetous, you know, uh, uh, it's a covetous spirit that lust to envy, the Bible says. And if we just let the old man have his way, you know, we're going to end up being unkind people. It's something we have to put into practice. And people are often unkind. And how are they unkind? Well, often they're unkind in their actions, right? That's a big thing. But, you know, more so they're unkind in their words, but they are unkind in their actions and what they do to others. You know, what they might actually, you know, go out of their way to do to somebody. And there's, you know, we could go on and on about that. There's so many different ways where we could, I always, you know, my mind just always goes back to traffic. <laughs> <laughs> Probably because I, I, every time I come down here, I'm spending an hour and a half on the road, right? So I've always, I feel like that's the one illustration that's always just at hand for me. You know, people are always unkind on the road. You know, it just seems like it's getting worse. But, you know, there's probably other, ag other examples. You know, I don't want to, I, I mean, can anybody else think of a way that sometimes people are just unkind out in the world? No, no one? No one's got anything? <laughs> you got one? People that wear masks or don't wear masks. Yeah, the mask wearing? Yeah. Okay. People want to get in fights. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's a good example. You know, people want to just tear each other apart. You know, you're not wearing a mask. You should be wearing a mask and just start going at it. That could be one way. You know, everyone has got different opinions about that. But we don't have to always go out of our way to, like, you know, beat somebody up over it or something, you know. Let the establishment handle that, right? There was, but you get it. People do things all the time that are just rude sometimes. I remember one time I went into a Panda Express. And, uh, you know, it was like the first time I'd gone into Panda Express. And I didn't really know how it worked. So I kind of walked up there, and then uh, the guy, and there was another lady standing next to me, and the guy came to me and asked me what I wanted. And she hadn't ordered yet, and she was there ahead of me. So I just started telling him, and she just kind of looked. She said, oh, I guess I'm not here then. You know, she got, I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you hadn't ordered. Go right ahead, you know. But people do unkind things. I don't know if that was, I was actually being kind by, you know, saying, go ahead. But people do unkind things to each other, right? One way people are unkind is that they don't always show mercy. You know, go over to Luke chapter 6. Luke, Luke chapter 6. I mean, that's how we ended it in Matthew chapter 5. Do good to them that hate you. You know, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. That's what he repeats over here in Luke chapter 6. He says, love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. That be ye therefore merciful. See how being kind and being merciful are intertwined there, how, they're, how they mean the same thing. You say, hey, be kind unto the unthankful. And he is kind to the un unthankful and the evil. Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. You know, God being kind to the unthankful and to the unevil is him being merciful unto them. And one way people are very unkind towards one another is they're not merciful. And people need to learn to be merciful one toward another. You know, and here's the thing. Here's a good reason why you should be merciful to another person. It's not just because it's the, you know, what God commands, but because, you know, who's, you know, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Right. God will, will show mercy unto the merciful. And here's the thing. We're all going to need mercy at some point. Every last one of us. Is going to need you know others to be merciful towards us, to be kind, to be forgiving. We're going to need God to be merciful for, towards us, you know, many times. So if we want that from God, if we want God to be merciful to us, then we have to extend that same courtesy to others and be kind and be merciful. So people are often unkind in their actions, and one way, uh, one action that they that they'll be un, uh, the, that the uh, one action that is unkind, I should say, is that they don't show mercy. They're unmerciful. But even more than what people do, it's, it's what they say. People are probably most unkind with their words, the way they use their words. I mean, did you notice as we are reading all those scriptures this morning, all those scriptures that I read, how often the communication was associated with kindness? Love as brethren, not rendering railing for ra railing, but contrawise blessing. Those are things that are done with your mouth. You know, the railing and the blessing are both done with the tongue. Speak evil of no man, it said. You know, again, speaking. What did it say in Proverbs where we read this morning? She, uh, she openeth her mouth, with, her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. You know, one of, the, one of the main ways that people are unkind 
is with their mouth. You know, and today we have so much more opportunity to, to be unkind thanks to social media. There's so much more opportunity to use, maybe not our mouth per se, but to use communication to express our thoughts and feelings and opinions. And oftentimes, you know, we can be very unkind about it. <coughs> There's a lot of unkindness that comes from, from the mouth. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Communication is, is associated often with being kind in the Bible. God warns us when he tells us, you know, to, to have the law of kindness in our mouth. He goes on and we see just example after example after example of watching how we use our mouth, how we express or ourselves, how we communicate. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Look, uh, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Now, most people, when they read that, they just assume well, he's talking about, you know, potty talk, you know, or <laughs> having a caca mouth or whatever, you know, which we shouldn't have either. But look at the context here. Let no corrupt communi uh, communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed in the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So that corrupt communication proceeds out of your mouth and it grieves the Holy Spirit. It does not minister grace unto the, hear unto the hearers. And what does it involve in verse 31? Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking. He goes on and says in verse 32, and be ye kind one to another. One of the best ways we can show kindness towards other people is with our mouth. By not being bitter, by not being wrathful or angry or clamorous and having evil speaking in our mouth towards other people. But rather, you know, being kind one another involves being tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, God for, uh, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Go over to James chapter 3, another very familiar passage. People are unkind with their words. The Bible says that the law of kindness should be in our mouth. That we should open our mouth with wisdom. That we should be careful about what we say. It says in James chapter 3 verse 8, But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to so, so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? So he's saying, look, <laughs> the tongue is an unruly evil. It's full of deadly poison. We bless God and then we curse men. And he says, out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. They both come out of the same fountain. You know, the water that is sweet and bitter. And he says, these things ought not to be so. And I think sometimes we read that and we think James has given us an option. Like, hey, it can't be both, so pick one. You know, that's not what he's saying here. Well, I can't, you know, well, James, I guess if i got to pick one, I'm just going to go with cursing then. I'll just get rid of the sweet water and just be all bitter. That's not what he's saying. If we're going to obey the law of kindness, if we're going to be kind people, if people are going to look at us and say, these are Christ's disciples. The law of kindness is found where? In their mouth. We must tame the tongue. If we're going to obey the law of kindness, we must tame the tongue. And bring it into subjection. You know, we all know James 3, the tongue is a powerful member of our body. He compares it under the helm of, a, of a, gr a small helm of a great ship that can drive that ship against fierce winds. He says, Behold how little, a matter, uh, uh, how little a matter a little fire kindleth. How great a matter a little fire kindleth. You know, we got a great example of that over in Mount Lemmon this summer, right? One little lightning strike, just whoo, how many, you know, tens of thousands of acres burned. I think it's in triple, it's like a six-figure number, I think, now. It's way up there. And it was just one little lightning strike. And he's saying, look, your tongue is the same way. If you don't have the law of kindness in your mouth, just one, one just say one thing, just be rude one time. Just curse somebody one time and it can just grow and it can just become a great fire. <clears throat> Go over to Proverbs chapter 10. We're going to look at quite a few passages here in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 10. If we're going to obey the law of kindness, we must tame the tongue. <clears throat> he 
He says, Proverbs chapter 10, I'll begin reading in verse 18. He that hideth hatred with lying lips, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. You know, that's a really good passage to think about. And that's something we should think about often, is that in the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. You know, let me just bring it into the modern vernacular here. Sometimes it's good to just shut up. <laughs> and the Bible says that. You know, if thou hast done foolishly lifting up thyself, lay thine hand upon thy mouth. You know, it's a very eloquent way of saying shut up. <laughs> Basically. <clears throat> and sometimes that would keep us out of a lot of trouble. I mean, I do it all the time. Well, not all the time. It's gotten less and less. You know, I'll be on, I'll be on Facebook or YouTube or whatever. I'll start typing something. I'll be like, eh, delete. It's not worth it. Is it just e it's just cursing, it's just wrath, it's just anger, it's just malice. It's not kindness, it's not mercy, it's not love. And you're like, well, you don't understand what they said. They really had it coming. <laughs> well, you know what? You might get drawn into something that just leads to sin. It says in verse 20, the tongue of the just is as choice silver, and the heart of the wicked is of little worth. The lips of the righteous feedeth many, but fools die for want of wisdom. I love that, that the tongue of the just is as choice silver. You know, that's a very precious thing. It's something that has great value. And we are the just if we're just, you know, we're justified in Christ. We have the Spirit of God dwelling within us. Our tongue should be as choice silver. It should be of great worth. And we'll see here what he means by that. Go over to Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15. The Bible says, There is that speaketh like the, the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. You know, the law of kindness in our mouth is going, to, is going to edify people. It's going to bring health to them. It's going to encourage them. It's going to lift people up. It's not going to be like the piercings of a sword where it just hurts or it just wounds. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 15, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. But perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. He says it's a tree of life. You, know, I just, you can't help but think about soul winning when you read that. Preaching the gospel. What is it that makes the, the, the tongue of the just as choice silver? It's the fact that it is a tree of life that's in your mouth. You have the ability to preach the gospel, you know, to bring forth fruit unto God. Go over to Proverbs chapter 15, look at verse 23. The Bible says in verse 23, A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth. A word spoken in due season, how good it is. In due season. How good, a, a word spoken in due season, how good it is. You know, when you, when you say the right thing at the right time, that brings you joy. And I'm not just talking about, you know, when you think of that great comeback. <laughs> you know, somebody says something, you're, you're thinking about it later, you're like, oh, I should have said that. <laughs> All right? That's not what it's talking about. Okay? You know, when somebody actually has a problem, when somebody ha has a need, and you ha you're like, oh, I know wh just what to say to that person, and then it helps them. You know, it's a, it's, it's, um, wh what is it? It, it it's, it's health to them, it says. Go over to uh, Proverbs chapter 25. You know, the, the tongue of the, ch of the just is as choice silver. It's very valuable. You know, the tongue in our mouth is a very powerful member. There's a lot of strength in it. It says in Proverbs 18, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You could take your tongue and destroy somebody. You know, we go out with the wrong spirit, the wrong attitude. The law of kindness is not in our mouth. Out soul winning, we run into somebody that we were just having a bad day. It's a hundred and whatever. Brother Corbin went really way too long this morning in that sermon, you know. And you just kind of have a bad attitude and we get to the, the wrong door, the wrong, you know, they just say something, it just sets us off. And that person's like, oh, I see what those Christians are all about. And then the next time some soul winner comes, you're like, yeah, I remember the last guy. And we have to be careful about that. You know, and I've been guilty of that. You know, getting in the flesh out there, it's, it, it can happen. You know, you find yourself standing in the street yelling at them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> then you're going to try and go to their neighbor. Their neighbor's been looking out the window the whole time, watching you, you Judaizer, you burn in hell. And then they see you coming, walking up the door, it's just, shh. 
Turn off the lights. Nobody's home, right? And what happened? Death. You know, maybe it wasn't what you said directly to that person, but maybe they overheard you say something to somebody. And now they don't want to hear what you have to say. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You're there in Proverbs 25. It says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. Knowing the right, what to say at the right time. Knowing the right thing to say at the right time. Look at Proverbs 25, verse 15. By long forbearing is a prince persuaded, and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. It's that word fitly spoken. It's saying the right thing at the right time. By long forbearing. You know, by knowing, you know, this isn't the time to say anything about this. You know, sometimes when I was reading this, it just made me think about, you know, wives that want to get something out of their husband. <laughs> you know, how they, get, how they get them to do things that they need done around the house. I, typically, if they're anything like me, the more my wife, you know, I want to say nag, because she doesn't nag, but the more she's like, can you do this, can you do this, can you do this, the more I'm just like, well, I'm not going to do it then. Because <laughs> you're telling me what to do, right? But you know, when, 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 it's, when it's long forbearing, you know, when she says it at the right time, when she puts the, the list out, you know, it just, it just leaves it by the wallet, there's just a list of things. Didn't say anything. Through her patience, through her long forbearing and putting up with my stubbornness, you know, that, so that, that, that tongue, what, what does it do? The soft tongue break at the bone. And the prince, right, he says, all right, you know, I'll go change the, the bank address or I'll go get the water or whatever it is I'm supposed to be doing as a, as a husband. <coughs> Shame on me anyway, right? But by long forbearing is a prince persuaded. You know, that's, that's something we need to apply in our life, you know. Maybe there's somebody that we're having a hard time with. Maybe there's somebody that we need to, we want them to, to change or do something for us. The way to go about getting that is not to just harp and nag and berate and speak evil about, but to wait. Wait for the right moment. Have a word fitly spoken. Say the right thing at the right time and you can really change people. You know, again, going back to the gospel. A lot of us have, you know, unsaved loved ones. And if you're anything like almost every person gets saved and they first get saved, what do they do? They go right to the family and they tell everybody how to get saved and that they need to get saved and everything that's wrong with what they used to believe. And, you know, it's especially hard with parents. You know, when, when you get saved and then you go to your parents, you know, two hours later or whatever, you know, immediately, and you're just, you're like, let me just answer life's most complex question, mom and dad. I figured it out. Right. You know, I know you couldn't tell me the meaning of life and you could tell me anything about the afterlife, but I'm here to tell you now. And then we're surprised that they don't want to hear it. And then we, we get discouraged. But maybe what we should do is just have some long forbearing, you know, with our loved ones, with our parents, with our brothers, with our sisters, with our immediate family members who've seen this change in you. Be, have some long forbearing and wait for a word fitly spoken. You know what it'll be? It'll be a soft tongue that does what? That breaks the bone. That gets them to yield, that will get them to finally listen and get saved. <coughs> If the law of kindness is going to, you know, if we're going to be kind people, if we're going to have obey the law of kindness, it has to be in our mouth. Because that's where people seem to do the most damage is with the tongue. And James says, you know, that we have to bring it under subjection. But you know what else he said in that passage? The tongue can no man tame. So it's kind of, kind of it seems like, well, what's the point then? I mean, we're supposed to have the law of kindness in our mouth. We read all these proverbs about the blessing of, you know, word fitly spoken. You know, the, 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 the tongue of the just is as choice silver. We le read all these things about the tongue and the mouth. And then we're supposed to control it and say this. And then we get to James and he reads, and the tongue no man can tame. And it's like, well, I give up. <laughs> what do you mean, James? Well, what he's saying here is this, is that we need God's help. We need God's help. We need to ask God to help us with the tongue. He says, it, you know, any man that can, bri any man that can bridle the tongue can, can, can you know, can uh, tame the whole body. You know, I'm paraphrasing. He can bring the whole body in subjection. If you can tame your tongue, so many other things in your life will just line up with God. So many other things in your Christian walk will just, if you just focus on that one thing, the words that come out of my mouth. Because you'll realize real quick that if you're going to tame the tongue, you're going to need God's help. And you're going to find yourself in prayer, you're going to find yourself confessing. You're going to find yourself asking God to help you. Lord, help me to control my tongue. 
help me to say the right thing to this person, help me to treat this person this way, and so on and so forth. We need God's help to do it. You know, what ways people that are unkind, you know, it's often what they do to each other, but it's also what they say most of the time. And I'll close with this thought. Sometimes the way people are unkind is what they won't do for others. It's not always what we do to others. Sometimes it's in what we won't do. Okay? And I had you start out Matthew 5. Go back there. That's where we'll end this morning. The Bible says in 1 John 3, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You know, it's not just enough to say all the right things. Sometimes we have to be willing to do things for people. You think, oh, I'm going to be a kind person, so I'm not going to do certain things to some people. You know, I'm not going to, I'm going to make sure I don't say this or don't do that. But some, a lot of times the way we're unkind is what we, are, we refuse to do for people. We shut up our bowels of compassion towards our own brethren. We see them going through a hard time or they have a need of some kind and we just say, well, that's their problem. How dwells the love of God in, that, in him? How, are, how, is, how is the world going to look at us and say, these are Christ's disciples if we don't have love one toward another? And a lot of times the way we show that love one toward another is that we help each other out. And, so, and there's a lot of different ways we can do that. But he says, not to love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. It's not just to be, a, you know, as James said, a doer of the word, and, but, to, but to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And we have to do these things, not just hear them. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. He said this. Jesus said in, in verse 38, You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, they resist not evil. Now, was it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth? Yeah, that's the law. That's, you know, that's in Deuteronomy and Exodus. That's, that's part of the civil law that God gave. And Jesus said, you know, Think not I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto thee, except uh, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law to all be fulfilled. So he's not nullifying this law of eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth. But what he, I think he's pointing out here is that he's saying, look, you can't take the, you, the civil law and apply it to your personal grievances. Somebody does us wrong, you know, we just feel like, well, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Cut me off in traffic, you know, right back at you. You know, say something rude to me, I'm just going to, I'm going to revile again. Because after all, it's eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It's eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, literally in the law. You know, if a, if, if a master smites a servant and he loses an eye, you know, he goes free. Blemish for blemish, eye for eye, tooth for a tooth. Hand for hand, foot for foot. That's what that's referring to. That's a literal eye for eye, tooth for tooth. He's saying, look, just because that's written in law doesn't mean that every personal grievance you have against somebody means you get to be mean and vindictive back towards them. If they treat you poorly, well, I get to treat them poorly then. That's not how it works. He said, I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if a man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. You know, the, the coat is the smaller garment underneath the cloak. At least if you have the cloak, you know, you're covering most everything, right? Oh, you need a coat? Well, here, have the cloak. It's even better. He's saying, don't render evil for evil. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. And every time I read that, I can't help think about the one example that I've always thought about is helping a brother move. <laughs> <laughs> I hate moving. I hate it. I loathe having to pack everything up, put it in a van, drive it, unload it all, then unpack it all. I hate moving. But you know what I hate worse than that? Helping somebody else move. Because <laughs> it's not my stuff. <coughs> You know, I don't have the satisfaction of unloading everything. And I don't know how many times I've been asked to help people move since I joined a, a Baptist church. I, and I don't, you know what? But to be fair, I've, I've called people plenty of times and said, hey, can you help me move? <laughs> I remember the la one of the last times uh, when we moved to Michigan, I decided I'm not going to ask for any help. I moved everything on my own. And it was, it was miserable. And I said, you need to just swallow your pride and ask for help. Because I hated helping other people move. I'll say, well, I don't want to help other people move, so I'm not going to ask anybody else to help me move. I'm going to give, you know, render eye for eye on this one, you know, tooth for a tooth. Well, you didn't help me. I'm not helping you. <laughs> right? But, you know, that compelling somebody to go a mile with you reminds me of like, hey, can you help me with something? Will you go this distance with me? Go with them twain. You know, 
Let me, let, me, uh, let me help you load up, and then I'll help you unload when I get there. Right. <coughs> Simple things like that. Really what this is boiling down to, verse 42, he says, Give to them that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn thou, thou away. You know, giving them your coat. The guy who's suing you at the law takes your coat and says, Well, have the cloak also. Some guy comes to you and inconveniences you by saying, Hey, can you go a mile with me? I'll go with you twain. What, are you, what is he saying here is basically that phrase we probably all heard, kill them with kindness. You ever heard that phrase, kill them with kindness? Instead of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, kill them with kindness. If you ever, I remember uh, somebody said that to me, I had a problem with a coworker, And it was really petty, I'm not gonna go into the details, but you know, it was early on in my Christian life. And uh, you know, I just remember just, just being upset about something real stupid, I can't remember what it was. And someone just said, well you know, just kill them with kindness. And I was like, man, he's right. And that works, too. You ever had like somebody who just hates your guts, doesn't like you, but then if you just do nice things for them, they kind of come around? Or at least they stop treating you poorly? Maybe just say something nice to them one day? You know, by long forbearing, you're putting up with all of their, you know, all the things that they say, that one, say, one day you just say something nice, and it breaks the bone, right? Because here's the thing. Most people want to be treated kindly. No matter how rude or mean or angry they seem, they want to be treated kindly. It's a strange person who doesn't want people to treat them nicely. You know, there's, that's a whole other sermon, <laughs> right? The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 19, if you would go to 1 Corinthians 13, we'll end there. It says the desire of a man is his kindness. The desire of a man is his kindness. You know what people desire from other people? You know what we, we desire from other men, from other people, is their kindness. And he said, a, and a poor man is better than a liar. I'd rather have, you know, a poor guy treat me nicely than some rich guy just lie to my face and treat me poorly. Does that make sense? The desire of man is his kindness. That's what we, what we really want out of people. And a poor man is better than a liar. You know, the, the poor guy who treats me nice and is kind to me, I'm going to prefer that guy over some rich jerk. It just treats me like dirt. That's what most people want. Most people just want to be treated nicely. And don't, I mean, don't all of us just want people to treat us nicely? Amen. Well, here's the thing. In order to oblige people, you have to love them. Say, so, you know what? I'm going to be nicer to people. I'm going to be kind. Good luck doing that without loving them. Good luck being kind and nice to people if you don't love them. I mean, there's people we should hate, right? We should hate those. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. I hate them with perfect hatred. We just sang it this morning. But that's them that hate him. You know, we hate the Lord's enemies. It's not hate. We're going to hate everybody that's our enemy. There's a difference. I think we all understand that. And if we're going to treat our enemies kindly, those that hate us, those that are our you know, personal enemies, you know, we're going to have to learn to love them. If we want to, you know, break the bone by long with a soft tongue, you're going to have to learn to love that person, even the unlovable. And hopefully, after all the scripture we read this morning, we would understand that we were pretty unlovable when God loved us. Yep. I mean, God loved us when He looked down on us and said, "I mean, at any time, God could have just went, I'll start over." I mean, how many times did He almost do that? <laughs> Go ask Noah how close he came, where God would just say, "Ah, you know, I'll just start over." How many times did He do that with Israel in the Old Testament? You know, come out of, get out of the way, Moses. Let me just consume them all. Start over with you. More than once. But God, even then, when he looked at us and saw how unlovable we were, still loved us. And what was he? He was kind. Because he loved us. In order to treat others kindly like they all want to be tr treated, you have to learn to love them. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It says, Charity suffereth long. Charity is an old, you know, another word for love. It suffers long means it puts up with a lot. It's willing to just go out there and take it on the chin in the world. It envieth not, it vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, and now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Look, if you want the law of kindness to be in your mouth, you're going to have to tame the tongue, yes, but you're also going to have, with God's help, but you're going to have to have charity in your heart. You're going to have to love people. And I think a lot of times we have a hard time being nice to people or we, we find ourselves, it's, if it comes very naturally to us to treat people poorly or be rude to people, especially the unsaved, it's probably because we don't really love them. You know, we just, because we, we, people they meet, they just form, 
you know, uh, you know, such, you know, split decision, just judgments. They just quickly, you know, size people up just from the way they look sometimes. They'll just see somebody and they'll just say, well, I don't like that person just because of the way they look. That's not a loving attitude. Right. And you're not going to love that person and you're not going to treat that person kindly like you're <laughs> supposed to because it's the law of kindness. You know, that's some, kindness should be one of our main attributes as God's people. If people should, de you know, describe us in just a few words, the word kindness should come out of their mouth. They should say, well, he's a very, he's a very nice guy. He's kind. <coughs> and, it, and in order to have that said of you, you have to love people. It says there, you know, the greatest of these is charity. It is love. The greatest Christian virtue is love. And how is it going to manifest itself? Through kindness. And how is kindness going to manifest itself? Through our words and through our deeds. Let's go ahead and pray.